So as we move into the second unit, the skeletal system, uh, you'll, you'll notice a change that, that the, the focus on histology has, has shifted now to a lot of gross anatomy, specifically the names of bones and the features of bones. Um, but we do have a little bit of histology and a little bit of generic gross anatomy that we're going to be covering this week. And so that's what this video clip is going to be addressing. Um, there are only a few tissue types that we're adding to our list, um, and the second exam is only going to focus on these. So the, the nice thing about this is if you know these four slides, that, then you're prepared for at least the histology part of this next exam. Um, and, and so we're adding to our list now a couple new connective tissues, specifically cartilage and bone. Uh, like the other connective tissue properties that we've learned, these are characterized as having cells within a non-living matrix. Um, and so the, the things that really distinguish these tissue types that we're going to see here now are the types of cells and uh, the components or composition of the matrix. And so the first three we're going to look at are, are cartilage. And, and cartilage is, is kind of a nice um, tissue. It has more of that classic gelatinous matrix due to water and, and some of the proteoglycans that we've learned about in lecture. Um, the cell types that we see here are referred to as chondrocytes. These are cartilage cells. So again, chondrocytes, unlike the fibroblasts, which was the kind of the generic cell type we saw in the connective tissue proper. Um, and so you'll, you'll notice here in this first view, this is an example of hyaline cartilage, the first one that we're going to be looking at. Um, and hyaline cartilage is the most common cartilage we have in our body. Um, it's the one that makes up the, the embryonic skeleton. Um, it's also found in the, in the tracheal cartilage, um, as well as the articular surfaces in other places. Um, and, and so the thing with hyaline cartilage is we have cells, we have these chondrocytes, and you can see here in this field of view, these large spaces here. These are referred to as lacunae, and lacunae refer to these spaces, these empty chambers. And within these lacunae are the cells, the chondrocytes. And you notice they're pretty large. And then we have this nice, almost smooth, glassy looking extracellular matrix. Now, the cartilages that we're going to look at today, two of them, will have this protective layer outside it. And so here and here, this area here is referred to as the perichondrium. So this is this layer of tissue that surrounds the cartilage. Um, there's a fibrous layer that's, that's typically a, a dense irregular connective tissue. And then there's this vascular layer here. So this perichondrium is something that you should be familiar with. We're gonna be able to see it on two of our cartilages. So the actual hyaline cartilage is this layer right in here. Um, and, and we take a closer look at this, we can see really clearly here that we have these spaces, these large cavities or chambers, again referred to as lacunae, within the cells inside them. So the chondrocytes, the cartilage cells, exist in these spaces and then are surrounded then by this extracellular matrix. And in the case of hyaline cartilage, it, it seems almost empty. It seems very clear, almost glassy-like. And, and that's because there isn't really a, a lot of thick collagen fibers. There's collagen here, but it doesn't stain like the thick bands we observed in the, in the past. Um, and there's also very little elastic fibers within this tissue. That is different than the second one we see here. So this is the second type of cartilage we have. This is elastic cartilage. Um, just to point out, this one also has this perichondrium. So it's gonna have this fibrous layer that surrounds either end. It's also gonna have the large spaces, the lacunae within the chondrocytes inside them. And then a nice, in this case, dark staining matrix. And the reason for this dark staining matrix, and when we look closer, is this one, as the name suggests, is filled with elastic fibers. And so these elastic fibers are staining very dark here. So unlike the hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage has a lot of elastic fibers, giving it this elastic property. And so we see elastic cartilage in the external ear um, and the epiglottis. And so two areas where you have this nice ability to kind of snap back after being stretched. Both of these and the next one we see are considered avascular. So cartilage is avascular, which means in addition to the protection and support provided by the perichondrium, this is also the vascular tissue. This is also the source of nourishment that then allows for these living chondrocytes to survive. The third type of cartilage that we see here, this is fibrocartilage. And fiber cartilage may look familiar. It has this almost wavy appearance like our dense regular connective tissue. And the truth is it's, it's very, very similar to that in that it has a prominent collagen fiber component to its extracellular matrix. And these fibers are arranged in pretty much parallel directions. Um, and so, so fiber cartilage has a really, really strong structure and thus function. Um, we associate this with the intervertebral discs of our back 
It's able to resist compression, and we also see this in the pubic symphysis area, the area between the two pubic bones. And so this third type of cartilage, the fiber cartilage, still has the lacunae, it still has the chondrocytes, but it has very significant collagen fibers that make up this extracellular matrix. This one doesn't have the perichondrium, and so unlike the first two, this one will not have the perichondrium. It has this very, very, very strong extracellular matrix component that's intrinsic to this tissue type. And so those are our, our three elastic tissues. Again, we only have four slides for the second unit. And so if you can distinguish between these three, understand the basic features, which is the chondrocytes in lacunae surrounded by a matrix that has the fiber component. And it's really the different fibers that, that describe or define these three different types of cartilages. Moving on to bone, um, in addition to the histology, which we'll get here in a moment, we're also having you look at just the gross anatomy of a long bone, in particular the femur. And so in lab, we have a real bone. We have a femur that's been split in half. That's going to allow you to see these structures. But I wanted to use this figure here just to give you some context so that when you do go into lab, you can, you can hopefully find these structures and understand these structures fairly well. And so here's the femur, here's the, here's the, the long bone of our thigh. Um, and, and when we talk about long bones, first off, we have these, these two regions. And so the first one here is the shaft or the diaphysis. And then we have the ends or the epiphyses. And so we have this distal epiphysis and this proximal epiphysis. And so these are just general terms that describe the overall areas of this long bone. Additionally, we will see that there is a layer of tissue that surrounds the bone. And then there's also a layer of tissue, if we can look closely here, that, that hugs the inner surface of this long bone. And similar to cartilage, these surrounding areas are connective tissue proper. And the names here would be the periosteum. So in cartilage, we have the perichondrium. Here we have the periosteum. Again, a, a dense collagen-rich CT layer that, that provides support to this, this long bone. And on the inside, if we can see closer, we would have a very, very thin layer of reticular CT known as the endosteum. And so we have this supportive connective tissue surrounding the bone tissue itself. In addition to this, this figure shows that there are two general types of bone. Up here, we see spongy bone. And so the spongy bone, as the name suggests, is kind of spongy. It's very light. There's a lot of airspace that's typically filled with bone marrow. Um, but it's also quite strong because of how the, these lattice-like bony struts are, are arranged. And so spongy, spongy bones typically at the epiphyses. And then in the center here, we have this large cavity, this medullary cavity or this marrow cavity. And in the adult long bones, this is typically filled with yellow marrow, um, lipid-rich marrow. Surrounding the medullary cavity is then a very, very compact, dense bone tissue referred to as compact bone. And so this tissue here is the compact bone, which we'll see is, is kind of very different in structure to the spongy bones that we saw at the epiphyses. The last thing I'll point out here before moving on to the histology slide is that Bone is vascular, and, and therefore bone depends on a, a constant supply of, of blood and, and, and nourishment. And so it has um, this need for vessels as well as nerves to enter the bone. And so we have these areas where vessels can enter, and they're referred to as nutrient firmina. And so you'll notice on your long bones that typically there's maybe one or two of these really small little openings where blood vessels would have entered. So hopefully you can find those on the femurs that you look at in class. But if we move on to the, the histology, imagine if we were to take a wedge out of this. So imagine a wedge that went from the periosteum out into the endosteum. That's what this model here is depicting. And so we also have, in addition to four slides, we have two models. So again, not a lot when it comes to histology. Um, so know these, these are the ones we have. And so again, just to orient yourself here, here's the endosteum. So imagine this would have been the medullary cavity. And then we have the periosteum here. Um, you'll notice a few things here that there are these fibers that are extending from the periosteum into the actual bone tissue itself. These are referred to as Sharpie's fibers and, and or perforating fibers. And these fibers help hold this fibrous periosteum to the actual compact bone tissue here. Um, so when we look at this tissue type in particular, we'll notice that, that there, there's a very ordered arrangement. And, and in fact, there are these circular structures that seem to be spaced pretty regularly throughout. These are the functional unit of compact bone, and these are referred to as the osteons. And these osteons, each one is going to be made up of rings or plates of bone tissue. 
And in the center of each one is going to be a canal, and this is referred to as the central canal. And you'll notice here that the central canal is going to be filled with the blood vessels and the nerves. Um, these central canals are at times connected using these horizontal canals or perforating canals. And so you'll notice that, that the nutrient supply, the blood vessels that are entering, let's say here, the periosteum, can continue horizontally through the bone tissue through these perforating canals, which then allow these horizontal or central canals to then radiate out. And so this is the general structure of compact bone. We, we see a lot of osteons, each one with a central canal, and these are all connected via these perforating canals. Now, if we look closely at one of these osteons, you'll notice that there are rings, and this ring is, is of the bony tissue, and also there are these small dots, these small little chambers. These are the lacunae. So just like in cartilage, bone also has these empty cavities, lacunae, that are typically filled with cells. And so in this area, they've tried to depict those cells with black dots. The cells here are osteocytes, so bone cells, these are the osteocytes, these are the ones that are maintaining the bony matrix. Now, Unlike cartilage, the matrix here is very, very, very solid. It has this inorganic component, this calcium rich. And so the extracellular matrix here is, is made up of collagen fibers. And you'll notice that the collagen fibers are, are arranged in this, this spiral pattern. And, and interestingly, the, they alternate. And so in one ring here, we can see the collagen fibers running to right to left to right. And here they go the other direction. And so these collagen fibers that then become surrounded by this, this mineral calcium rich material produces a very strong structure. The next figure here, just to kind of move on and get through this very quickly is, is the an actual slide. So this is the histology, but, but hopefully now you can have an idea of what we're looking at here, right? We can see some of the osteons. We can see the central canals here. We can see these black dots would represent lacunae that are maybe filled with osteocytes. Right here in this side, we can actually see one of those perforating canals. There's only a few of the slides that kind of show these, but you can see that these two central canals are connected by this horizontal perforating canal. Right. In addition to this, you can see that there are spaces like out here that don't seem to be associated with any particular osteon. Right. So some of these rings or perjus lamellae are clearly associated with one particular osteon. And those that surround a central canal, these are referred to as concentric lamellae, concentric lamellae. Whereas these plates or rings that seem to be maybe leftovers or old ones, these are referred to as interstitial lamellae. And so you should be able to distinguish between the concentric lamellae, the plates or rings of bony tissue associated with a single osteon versus the ones that, that seem to be associated with maybe an old osteon um, or just sort of filling the space in between. This next slide is, is really nice. It's just a closer view of a particular osteon. And what this is showing you here is that in fact, these cells, these osteocytes, are not entirely isolated from each other. That, in fact, there are these really small little canals, they're referred to as canaliculi. And these canaliculi are small little canals that connect these lacunae. And the, the living cells, these osteocytes, have these cytoplasmic extensions that will connect each other. So there's a physical touching right here between these two osteocytes and that the physical contact allows for the presence of gap junctions, allows for the, the communication and the transport of nutrients between them. And so the, the extracellular matrix is not able to transport the nutrients very well. Diffusion doesn't occur because of this inorganic solid component. And so it really depends on these small little canals, these canaliculi, for the nutrient-rich conditions here where the various blood vessels are in the central canal to then reach some of these outer osteocytes. And so these osteocytes are alive, they're active, they're, 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 they're metabolically active, they're maintaining this, this, this outer area, this matrix, but that depends on a direct connection to the nutrient source here. And it's through these small little canals or canaliculi that they can do that. And so this is a nice figure really showing these microscopic canals through the bone matrix that allows the connection with the central canal. Um, we have this other model just to point out here, and so you're familiar that this hopefully is, is pretty straightforward now that we've seen some of the, the real histology slides. But here we can see a single osteon. We have the central canal with the vessels. On the right here, they're showing the lacunae that are empty with the canaliculi. On the left, they're trying to depict then the osteocytes 
with then these cytoplasmic extensions connecting each. Um, so hopefully this gives you a, enough of an introduction to these tissue types uh, to prepare you for lab this week.